Good morning. I, I believe it's necessary, uh, if only briefly, just to kind of give a quick summary for our guests who have been here for the last few weeks and the ones that are here, of course, today, is that um, the Christian church itself is actually what you would consider a frontier church. The where we were founded, and this, of course, is getting before my sermon, but just to kind of give you a quick rundown of what the Christian church actually is, we were started in the late 1700s. Uh, there was a revival down in the Kentucky-Tennessee border area back in the 1700s, and there was a handful of churches in this one town. They decided to have a town revival. There was, a, if I remember correctly, a Baptist, Presbyterian, and a Methodist. And they all had his church service together. And the idea that came out of the revival was a very simple one, and it was to basically to just try to get back to the Bible as much as possible. Because you've got to remember, in the late 1700s in Kentucky and Tennessee, there wasn't exactly a lot of places where you could go and get a very, very detailed theological education. So they said, you know, we don't necessarily have all the books, we don't have all the studies, but we have the Bible. So let's go by what we have. And so that's what they did. And out of it, they never actually meant to create their own congregation. And, but what did happen over time is they kind of created a congregation that's, um, if you're familiar with the word ecumenical, in the fact that they are very, very open. We're uh, a very, very, um, I guess you could say, uh, we, we don't consider ourselves by any means the only Christians, but instead we're just Christians only. And that's where the idea of the name Christian Church comes from. It's not that we think we're any better or anything of that nature, but instead rather that we just want to celebrate Christ. And so that's kind of the cornerstone of the Christian Church, and that's kind of a good rundown as to who we are and what we believe. We, we tend not to get into too many issues beyond things of salvation. That's where our primary focus is in. Now the thing is, is though whenever it comes to a, a thing of salvation, we are very, very serious about those things. And so today that actually brings us to a very interesting passage of scripture. Um, there is a quote that I had heard many, many years ago, and this is kind of a paraphrase of it. The quote goes, hard times create strong people. Strong people create good times. Good times create soft people. Soft people create hard times. And the idea is very, very simple. The idea is that whenever things are good, people become soft because they can. And as a result, things go bad because they're not keeping up on things. They're not working toward things. They're not establishing goals for themselves. They're not trying and striving. But whenever things are hard, people have to become hard. And so what it is for us as Christians I want to speak about this predominantly within a spiritual sense. And the passage we're going to deal with today is actually the book of Romans, chapter 6. Romans, chapter 6. And it'll help us to really nail down some good guidelines as what it means to be Christian, but also focused on the kingdom of God above all else. Romans, chapter 6. We'll be in verse 1 if you have your Bibles with you. While you're turning there, a um, brief introduction to myself. My name is Wes. <laughs> I, I've been here for not quite 20 years. I actually grew up Methodist. I went to a Christian church college to learn uh, pastoral skills, I guess you could say. And um, oddly enough, I'm, I'm not really Methodist anymore so much, but I am definitely heavily influenced by a lot of the other different faith backgrounds, I guess you could say, within Christianity. But I'm also a history nerd, so I love history. It's kind of my thing. So Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And we will stop right there. One of the first things I want to say is this. It's very, very simple. It says, if grace increases where our sin increases, is it fine to sin? The answer is no, because sin is not normal. It's an aberration. And therefore, it's important for us to recognize not to normalize things that are not normal. Now, the Christian church, its doctrine is very clear. We are very, very traditional. 
We, we might be very, very lenient in a lot of things, but we are traditional. We hold to what the Bible says. And the thing is, is that we look at this thing and we look at the world around us, we recognize there's a lot of things out there that are not normal anymore. They try to normalize a lot of things. We don't go along with those things. It is only a dead fish that goes with the flow. And we are not a dead fish. Instead, though, what we say is very simple. We have died to this world through baptism. We have been made alive once more in Christ. Our philosophy and teaching regarding baptism is very, very clear. Baptism, of course, uh, the Greek word baptizo, to literally means to submerge. And what we teach is the idea that as you are lowered below the water, you literally die to this world. And as you come back up out, you are, in fact, created as a new creation within Christ. And as the book of Acts tells us, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And within that, Christ guides us for all of our days. It's not that we are perfect, but instead that we have a new life and that we are striving to become better. The big fancy $12 word is sanctification. At the moment of baptism, we believe a person is sanctified. Does that mean that they are perfect? No, but it means that God views them as perfect as he views his son within them. And we recognize that regenerative process will take time to help us to become more and more like Christ. And that is our ultimate goal. But the first thing is we have to recognize that sin itself is death. The wages of sin is death. And within sin, there is no hope. There is no future. But within love, there is hope. There is future. And caring for one another and walking with each other within this dark world and helping to lift each other during difficult times those are the hallmarks of God's people. Those are the things that carry us through. Those are the things that give us hope. If you look during some of the darkest moments in history, you will find that in all things, people who are doing good are the ones who are regarded as legends. I remember many, many years ago, there was a story out of Eastern Europe. I don't remember exactly where, but this man had been a... Uh, kind of a nominal Christian, but hadn't gone to church in a very, very long time. And one day there was a new priest in town, and, and he went to visit him because he had not been to their parish yet. And if I remember correctly, the story goes something to this effect. He comes to the man's house, and he says very simply to him, I, I've noticed you've not been to the church since I've become priest here, and, and what's happening, basically. And he says very simply back to him, he says, you know, I, I've seen so many bad, terrible things from religion. You know, whether it be this group or that group or what have you, they're fighting against each other all the time. And I've seen people killed even. He said, I want no part of it. The priest said back to him very simply, if I were to come into your home and I were to take your coat and I was to walk into town and rob the bank, who would they say robbed the bank? He said, of course, it would be me. And this conversation went on for a number of years and he would come and visit him year after year. Finally, one year, he went in a course and he said to the man once again, why have you not been to our church? And he says, you know what? You're right. He said, you know, the simple truth is you have worn the coat of Christ well. You see, the truth is we as Christians, we are donning the coat of Christ and we are walking as representations of him within this world. So people look to us as guides as to what it means to be Christian. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but we have to do our very best to wear that coat as best we can. Because people... This may only be their only opportunity or only exposure to knowing who Christ is, is through the actions that we take. And so therefore, it is important for us, if we're going to carry the name Christian, to make sure we leave as good impression as we can, not for our own sake, but for the sake of others and for the honor of Christ. And so it is important for us to wear the coat of Christ well. And one of those things is to rebuke sin within our own lives, to walk away from it, and to live as good as we can. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but it means we're getting better. Let's read on. Verse 5, it says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be also united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, so we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. 
The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. The Apostle Paul talks a lot about the idea of this old self being crucified. And it's amazing to me, and one of the things I love about the Apostle Paul is early on in his writings, he talks about being the least of the apostles. Eventually he goes to the point of calling himself the least of the Christians. Eventually call himself the chief of all sinners. And this is a man that many Christians look up to. And the reason why is because he realized as he got closer to God, he saw more clearly his own heart. And in so doing, realized that he can't do it. It is only through Christ's grace that we can live. But we also have to daily remind ourselves that our old self has been crucified and that we now live a new life. And as a result, sin no longer is our master. We are no longer slaves to sin, but we are in fact slaves to righteousness. Sin is death. To sin is to choose death, but to choose Christ is to live. And in choosing Christ, not only living, but loving and caring for our neighbors as though they are ourselves. To take up each other's burdens, to lift one another during difficult hours, but most importantly, above all else, making sure that we give the best representation that we can within this world. Because within us may be the only opportunity a person has to see who Christ is. The old self has been crucified, it's put away. The Apostle Paul talks about how there is a battle even within himself. This is, this is Paul we're talking about. And he talks about how there is a battle within himself and how this old man wants to do the old things, but his new spirit, his new creation says, no, I don't. And there's this continual battle even within himself. The struggle is very, very real. It's hard. It's hard to be holy. It really is. The truth is, though, if it wasn't hard, we wouldn't be called to it. We'd just fall into it on accident anyways. And that's kind of the point. Anything worth doing, I've always heard it said that if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. That's wrong. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly until you get it right. It's worth doing poorly until you get it right. That's the simple truth. I remember many years ago, I began preaching I preached what they called supply preaching. Whenever a pastor would go on vacation for the week, I was the guy who would show up from the local college. And nine times out of ten, I wouldn't even know where I was going. And hopefully I wound up at the right church. And it, it was terrible. I'm going to be honest. It's probably still terrible. But I got a little more experience at being terrible. Someday, I might actually be decent. Maybe. The point is this, though. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly until you get it right. Fight this world, struggle against the darkness. Because the truth is, and this is a kind of a cliche statement, but there's an old Garth Brooks song where it talks about the idea of this world. We don't do these things to change the world. We do these things to make sure the world doesn't change us. We don't want to be like that. We don't want to be heartless. We don't want to be cold. We don't want to be cruel. All you got to do, turn on the television or radio and you see heartless, cold, and cruel every day. That's not who we are. Let's read on, verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. Once we have chosen Christ, there is no turning back. Not one step back. Not one step back. Once we have chosen Christ, there is no turning back. And we are not perfect, but we're better. We're not at 100%, but we're getting there. We're working toward it. So don't give up hope either. Don't get discouraged. The word escapes me at the moment. But there's a very simple idea. 
that eventually if you become discouraged too much, you eventually you just give up. And that's what the world wants to do. It wants to beat you down to the point where you think evil and darkness is one. But the truth is, 2,000 years later, here is the church of Christ. And lightness still shines. So it is for us to recognize that we cannot turn back. But we must share that gospel, that truth, that hope, that light that is for the world, for all. We're not perfect, but we're better. And we're getting better every day. One other final point I want to make, and that is this. While every one of us was still lost in sin, God still loved us enough to send His Son. There's not a single person out there in this world that you have ever met that God doesn't love. Not one. Keep these things in our hearts and our minds to guide us the way that we deal with one another, but more importantly also to recognize the importance that God puts on every single soul. The love that He laid down wasn't just for me or for you, but it was for all people. And it's vital for us to recognize His creation in His hand in the hearts of all men. In conclusion, as we go throughout this week, the book of Romans is fantastically wonderful. The Apostle Paul blessed us with so many great words, such great guidance. If you ever have the opportunity, just sit down and read the whole book. It's wonderful. You're going you're gonna to love it. You'll thank yourself for it later. It's one of those books that I highly recommend to just, just pick up and read in the afternoon. Pick through the whole thing. It's a beautiful piece of work. But remember these things. Sin is not okay. It's not okay to live in sin. It's not our, it's not our futures. That's our past. But also remember that we are now united with Christ. And we represent His church. We represent His hope within this world. Do it the best we can. We're not going to be perfect, but we can become better. But above all else, always remember, we're no longer, no longer slaves to sin, but rather slaves to His righteousness. If you would, our closing hymn is page 528, and please stand. Um.